Good morning, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you for asking me to join you. I spoke here a couple of years ago about um, string truncation and signals and things like that. Um, and it is a true honor to be able to talk about some of this obscure stuff that I am passionate about and not be alone in the room when I do it. Um, so this is all good. So um, most of what I have done uh, has been related to DNS. I took, took over Bind when the BSD team uh, eventually sort of stopped working on it. I started a company, Internet Systems Consortium, that then took over Bind from me. Um, so I was responsible for late Bind 4, all of Bind 8, and none of Bind 9. That's got none of my code in it. Um, and somewhere along the line, I decided, you know, this DNS thing is very interesting, uh, but I also want to do at least one other thing with my life, so um, Let's just let the team take over, and they did, and they've done a fantastic job. Uh, I am also somewhat well known for having started the first distributed reputation company called MAPS, the Mail Abuse Prevention System. It was also spam spelled backward, and we felt very clever. Uh, so the RBL that will be the uh, be part of the gateway to every email message you receive for the rest of your natural lives uh, was invented at, at that time by that project. Uh, clearly did not solve the spam problem, but it should at least establish my credentials as having cared about this sort of thing for a long time. Now, when I stopped working on DNS itself, I chose a very closely related field, which is how to use DNS to secure other things. There are plenty of people working on hardening and securing DNS. Uh, I did that in the 90s and in the early 2000s. I don't need to be doing that now. There are perfectly qualified people pushing that forward. Um, on the other hand, DNS has become a vital control point for securing our digital assets. By us, I refer to the enterprise and consultants, small office, home office. Uh, although it has some applicability on uh, so-called public networks like ISPs, and I'll get into the subtle differences between those types of networks in a moment. Um, but in any case, uh, DNS is the map if the internet is the territory. I know that BGP is very important, the routing system, the addressing system, you have to have all of the pieces to make it work. But at any given moment, uh, very few people are typing in IP addresses uh, or clicking on something that encodes an IP address when they want to go somewhere or do something on the internet, we are clicking on names. Uh, the reason that clicking even works is because the web is all linked together using names. Um, and so everybody ha who has come into the internet field has noticed that there is this, uh, this thing called DNS. Uh, one guy printed up a bunch of t-shirts that said DNS is sexy which I had never thought before, but uh, from a business point of view, I suppose it is, because if you can uh, work your way into the DNS resolution path, uh, you can see a lot of what's going on. And if you can do so in a uh, sort of read-write read manner, you can also change what's going on. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about some of the history of that and um, sort of what's happening right now in terms of uh, the war for control of, uh, of this vital thing. Uh, so first, I want to acquaint everyone uh, with the very simple architecture of the DNS system. Now, I am not the inventor of DNS. Paul Makapetris, uh, who's a friend of mine and a member of my board of directors at, at Farsight, uh, invented this back in the 80s. And um, the fact that we're still using it today is a testament to how simple it had to be. Um, there's, there's no way to take a complex thing and scale it by a factor of 10 to the ninth, but a simple thing. Now we're talking. Anyway, your questions are coming in at the bottom. Your answers, or at least the data to create those answers, is coming in at the top, and they are meeting in the middle. Uh, all of the bugs that Bind has been known for are in the middle. 
um, because most of the complexity of the system itself is there. Asking questions and waiting for answers is fairly simple. Reading in zone files or contacting a database and generating answers is simple. On the other hand, maintaining that cache, figuring out uh, how to fill the cache with the things people need, uh, answering rapidly and correctly, in a distributed system where you're kind of at the mercy of everybody else's power supplies and uh, Ethernet cables, <clears throat> that is hard. Uh, so all of the fun in DNS and most of the attacks against it are that thing in the middle, a recursive server or a full resolver. Uh, that is where we will center our story today. So I won't talk this time about the prehistory of DNS or how, uh, how we got here, what the host file was, uh, because most of you already know, and at this point it's safe to not care. Um, so we'll pick up the story about the history of the development of all this and the economy that goes around it in 2005 or so when the first uh, wide-scale AnyCast DNS service, recursive service, came into existence. It was called OpenDNS. Um, and they did very well. They uh, ran that company until it was worth hundreds of millions of dollars to Cisco. Uh, so Cisco Umbrella is the old OpenDNS. Uh, and I knew the founder. I, uh, I've, I, I've worked with this team. They're good folks. On the other hand, this was somewhat controversial because we had all been running our recursive name servers uh, sort of on our LAN or at least in our building or on our campus or maybe using our ISP. So the idea that you would go all the way into the internet core and come out the other side somewhere and have a non-contracted party telling you the answers to your questions seemed a little bit crazy. <clears throat> but as you may have noted, it has caught on. Um, so one of the early things that OpenDNS tried, and they were part of the new generation of failing fast, right? They would try a thing, and if, it, if they weren't getting traction on it, they would just drop it. Uh, you see Google doing that to this day, and people are, uh, marvel at how quickly Google can kill something that looked like it had legs just a month earlier. Um, so one of the things they tried was advertising. Uh, if you ask a question, uh, for which there is no valid answer because you have a typographic error in, in, in the domain name, uh, they felt perfectly free to give you uh, an answer of sorts, uh, not a negative answer telling you that you're doing the wrong thing and, are, and that there's nothing there, but a positive answer pointing to some advertising service so that your typographical errors could be monetized. This was controversial. No one liked it. Uh, VeriSign tried something similar when they put a wild card at the root of the dot-com zone and uh, sold that traffic to SiteFinder. Uh, that was an even bigger controversy, but it gives you the idea that a lot of people for a long time have seen this as a path to riches. Um, and OpenDNS, in a way, created 8.8 .8 because one of the other things they tried was to intercept www.google.com Instead of giving you the address of Google's web server, they would give you the address of one of their own, which gave you a form that looked a lot like Google's search form, but they weren't, this wasn't a phishing attack. It was labeled OpenDNS. Um, and Google eventually got the data anyway, so they weren't taking anything away from Google. They were just front-ending it. What you would do is fill out the form, hit the Go button, and then get redirected to Google. So your, the answer to your question would be coming from Google. Uh, but that gave OpenDNS the ability to associate those keywords with your IP address, thus doing an ad optimization. Again, this was fiercely controversial at the time. And uh, you can imagine that somebody at Google called somebody at OpenDNS and said, please stop, and that the answer was something like, um, you know, we've studied the law and this is not illegal. Um, and you're not suffering because you're getting all the same traffic you would otherwise get. So we think we're going to keep doing this. And a few months later, Google announced 8.8 .8, um, because that was the only way they could figure out to make sure that there was a reliable source of unfiltered DNS. Uh, they have since made 8.8 .8 .8 a really big success. Uh, probably every one of us uses it at some point or another during our travels. 
then they have a reasonable privacy policy. It's not quite the same as giving your data to Google in other ways. Um, in particular, all of the GDPR complaints against Google have concerned something other than this. Um, however, if, uh, if the internet has taught us anything, it's that if you get traction, you will have uh, fellow travelers, you'll have copycats. And so we also have 9.9, .9, 1.1, and there are about 200 others that are out there. I know that 75.75 .75 is Comcast and 4.4 .4 is uh, le level three, but uh, there's still about 200 more of these that I think you're gonna see the newspaper headlines announcing each one. Um, and you can imagine that there are consultants in the IP addressing space researching exactly who uh, would have to sell exactly what in order to free up each of the other 200. Uh, and the reason that you'll see this is because it, uh, it's a very attractive position to be in the ecosystem. Uh, you get to see everything. And even if you don't monetize it, you're still benefiting from what you can see. Even if you don't change the answers or data mine it for keywords or whatever, it's still a very attractive position to be. And I, I say that knowing that I also collect data about the DNS. Um, I'll give, show you a picture of that in a moment. but. Um, the, the, the point being, this is, uh, this is a big deal, and it's been growing, and it's gonna grow faster. Because DNS, after all, is sexy. Um, so we've had some other interesting problems come to the DNS architecture, because uh, with content delivery networks, uh, if somebody goes to www.microsoft.com, and maybe that's not you in this room, although I go there, um, the, uh, they're, get, they're not getting an answer from a Microsoft-owned uh, name server. They're getting that from Akamai, whom Microsoft has hired to do content delivery services for the Microsoft web properties. And the principal benefit uh, that they get from this is that Akamai has got caches, web caches, all over the world. They've stuck them into every ISP, every exchange point, um, there is some powered box belonging to Akamai anywhere in the world that you can land an airplane. Uh, and that means if you send your web or your DNS request to Akamai or their competitors, I'm just using them as an example, they can give you an IP address uh, that will give you, that will supply you the answer to the web request you're making, but it's probably very close to you, either geographically close or topologically close. Uh, and that kind of uh, global optimized, whatever geo-optimized load balancing is also a big deal. A lot of companies do this. However, this does not work well in an AnyCast DNS world. So if you are sending, if, you're, if your customers, the people you want to come to Microsoft.com uh, are using Google's 8.8, .8, then you can't see the real customer's IP address at the time of the DNS query, which means you don't know which of your many mirrors and caches and proxies you should be get, uh, redirecting them to. Um, and that was the name of the game, because the earlier you can make that decision, then the faster you can get the uh, time to the next ad impression, which is uh, that's the main metric in that industry. So they don't want to wait for you to make a web request and then discover at that time that you're talking to the wrong proxy. They want to get you to the right proxy at the time of your DNS request. And they can't do that because you're not sharing topological fate with Google. Um, the, the query from, that gets forwarded to the Akamai authority servers from the Google recursive servers did not used to have any indication of who the end user was. Um, so this is kind of a fight between two different powerful organizations who each want to use the DNS to advance their own cause. And it really has nothing to do with us other than that perhaps we will get to the next ad a little faster. So the community of interest, which is all the CDNs and a lot of the Anycasters, uh, developed a new protocol uh, that adds on to extended DNS. It's called eDNS Client Subnet. And what that means is, let me go back a slide, uh, that the communication between the middle box and the top box includes a little tag that indicates the IP address of the bottom box. 
In other words, give me an answer that will be well-crafted for people who are going to then connect to you from this place. This may sound like an egregious uh, violation of privacy that was uh, in no way meant to help anybody in this room, uh, but certainly made a lot of money for a lot of powerful things. Uh, that's the pattern. Um, so we're lucky because EDNS client subnet might not include your total IP address. It might just be your class C network. Just enough to give a hint about where you are so that they can give you an answer that is good for that place. Uh, sadly, most of the traffic I see at my authority servers have a slash 32. In other words, all 32 bits are specified. Um, because the people who are making all the devices and the stub resolvers and whatnot did not get the memo, uh, and they figured that more bits would be better. Um, so uh, the law of unintended consequences scales nicely to the size of the internet. Uh, but I do, I do want to say that the uh, privacy implications of this are so abrasive uh, that Cloudflare in their 1.1 resolver does not pass on the EDNS client subnet. So uh, when you use 1.1, the authority server doesn't know where you are, unless it's one of Akamai's own authority servers, which I guess is a market advantage they have of running both the middle and the, and the top. Um, but um, I'm still very concerned about the uh, the tendency to say, well, I have an engineering problem, let's solve it by everybody having less privacy. So, um, as I said, we used to run our recursive name servers on our own LAN. As you may be able to easily predict, I run one on this laptop, because uh, I don't trust the one on the LAN. <clears throat> but um, if not in your LAN, at least in your campus or your ISP, because the further away you go, uh, the greater the probability that somebody's going to trip over a power cord that will uh, influence the quality of your experience, or that someone will have a passive optical splitter and be watching your traffic, because the more of the network you use, the larger the attack service, surface for those who would like to surveil you. And so again, to me, it's counterintuitive that you would go all the way to the internet core and then out the other side to reach a recursive server who then has to out you to the CDN. Uh, it's just, um, you know, I, I understand why it's attractive, but uh, it, it also uh, fits a, a line out of a song, uh, distant hands in foreign lands turning hidden wheels, causing things to come about which no one really feels. Uh, there really isn't anybody who is glad that this is happening other than somebody who is making some money right now that they wouldn't otherwise make. Uh, and their big plan is to uh, sell that and get out before it crashes. So because of the increase in the attack service, surface, uh, a lot of different individuals came up with ways to encrypt that traffic so that a passive optical splitter belonging, let's say, to the National Security Agency or their uh, sort of comrades overseas, um, you know, what if all they could see would be encrypted gibberish, then we might get back some of the privacy, even though we're clearly exposing everything we're doing to the thing at the far end, at least we might be able to protect the middle. So Dan Bernstein, who is a relatively famous programmer and uh, crypto guy, uh, developed something called DNS Crypt that was designed to secure the path between the bottom of that picture I showed you, the stub resolver, and the middle. Um, and it works. OpenDNS was the only production system ever to support it, and they still support it, even inside of the Cisco umbrella umbrella. Um, but it hasn't really caught on. Uh, it was just a little bit odd. Um, and as somebody who has uh, created a few technologies that didn't catch on because they were a little bit odd, uh, I have some sympathy for this. On the other hand, the standardized way to do this, uh, DNS over TLS, uh, is a vast improvement over everything DNS was doing before. When you make a TCP connection over port 53 and speak the protocol that was defined in RFC 1035, um, you are lucky if it works at all. And if everybody follows every rule that is in that specification, then it is so trivial 
to uh, create a denial of service against that server that, again, you will be lucky if it works at all. And indeed, someone who wants to uh, attack an endpoint or a uh, recursive server will often begin with an attack against the TCP53 listener so that you have no recourse except to listen to the lower quality data that you'll get from UDP. So again, it was, uh, it was time to revise the DNS protocol used by DNS, uh, the TCP protocol, sorry, that's used by DNS, and it was done, and it's, it's a good thing. It's good connection management. Uh, it has got perfectly reasonable security. There's no way to get better than modern TLS. If there were, we'd be using it. Uh, and that was the DNS community's answer to the need for privacy. Uh, the web community, however, had their own answer. And a year or two later, they created a technology called DNS over HTTPS. And this may seem a little bit mysterious to you because HTTPS uses TLS, so you're effectively adding a layer of HTTP um, between you and your DNS when it's not, clearly that HTTP doesn't offer any additional privacy. What it does offer is that it runs on TCP listener port 443, like the entire world economy. And um, so they were solving a different problem in that case. They were solving a political problem rather than a technical one. They, they added no actual privacy, but they did make sure that network operators would be afraid of blocking this protocol, right? I block outbound DNS from my networks unless it is coming from one of my name servers. Everybody inside my corporate network, everybody inside my home network has to use a recursive name server that I operate. And I'll get to the reasons for that in a moment, but the, the point is you can't easily do that if port 443 is used. It's not a simple firewall rule. Um, because you'll be cutting yourself off from the web itself. Uh, this was deliberate. The, uh, the people who backed it, the people who wrote the protocol, the people who have been arguing for it, have made no secret of the fact that uh, they're concerned about dissidents. They're concerned about somebody somewhere in some authoritarian regime who would like to blog in criticism of their government or to organize a protest. Uh, but they can't because uh, they can't get a clean DNS feed because the government controls the great firewall of China or whatever is the boogeyman of that day. And uh, the government doesn't want those communications to take place, and so they block DNS except to their servers. They do, in other words, at scale, countrywide, what I do at home. Um, and I don't think that the web people care what I do at home, but they care very deeply that this kind of thing cannot be done by oppressive regimes. And I have some sympathy for that position, uh, but only a little, because it turns out that much more harm is done by keeping me from blocking it than good is done by uh, keeping China or Turkey from blocking it. And I'm gonna get into that fine distinction in a moment. So, I mentioned that when I left the DNS field proper, went back into the security world, I uh, had the idea of using DNS to secure other things. And so it's taken quite some time, but there are now standard open source protocols and middleware for both looking at what that complicated box in the middle is doing in real time uh, and telling it to lie, telling it to do something different, to answer by policy <laughs> rather than with reference to fact. Uh, and you may think that that is a terrible idea if you're remembering things like ad insertion. On the other hand, if you th think about uh, all the ransomware attacks against all the people with Windows computers, and I guess phones are getting it now also, uh, those attacks require malware in your device to be able to find the, their command and control server, which does not have a fixed address, otherwise the police would just run right over there and put it out of business. No, they use the DNS as an indirection layer so they can find out where the, the command and control is at this moment. And they're using what's called a domain generation algorithm based on the current date and time. So you have, have on any given day some number of names by which the command and control server can be reached. Uh, and that puts them just far enough ahead of the law that they really can bring up a 
what's called the C2 server, to make that ransomware attack effective um, in a different place every hour of every day. Uh, and we're playing the Keystone Cops game, trying to find it and stop it. But if you have the algorithm and you pre-compute tomorrow's names and you tell your recursive name server not to answer for those names or to answer uh, with a negative answer or something else, you can prevent that command and control server from being reached. Um, and we do that. Uh, we in the security industry are using DNS in the ways that I'm saying. We're watching what the network is doing by looking at its DNS traffic. Uh, and this is really, really valuable for anomaly detection. And then we are filtering or adding policy uh, either locally, as you see here, or by actually subscribing to a commercial policy feed. All of this is open source. There's no royalty due my company for having invented those technologies. You should all be doing this. So if you take nothing else away with you, uh, please look at dnstap.info and dnsrpz.info, figure out how you're going to get started. Because once you do, you're going to be a little bit peeved that the IETF has created a bypass for all of that. So I mentioned that uh, DNS over HTTP is a political project. Uh, the technical problem of encrypting it had already been solved. The political problem of who is allowed to block it uh, is the part that they took special interest in. Um, and I, you know, I got to tell you, I am a parent. I'm using the, I'm using parental controls. I don't know why it is that Mozilla and Cloudflare, who are the ones pushing this project, want to have their own relationship with my minor underage children, bypassing my knowledge and my intent. It feels a little creepy. Um, but that is what they want. Um, I'm also uh, sort of doing this at work, right? So not just parental controls, but corporate security. Um, we use this, as many companies do, uh, in order to not just prevent that command and control server from being reached, but to detect the infected nodes by noting that only an infected node would have asked a certain, certain question. So this is vital, uh, not something that I can discard lightly. Um, the rest of our technology is not mine personally, but ours as a, as a world is really not ready for prime time. The internet uh, really should have gone back to the lab for another few years of kicking around before billions of people started using it. There's a lot of vulnerabilities in everything. I can't make sure that I don't have intruders on my network. I can't make sure that the supply chain isn't poisoned. We've recently seen a BIOS update go through some company that makes motherboards that uh, caused the tiny little other 386 chip that's inside your, your Pentium uh, running an old version of Linux to suddenly generate its own traffic and start communicating with its world using your hardware. And uh, what I'll say is, yeah, we probably need to solve all of those problems, but I can't just say, well, let's stop using DNS now and then we'll solve the problems that it is sheltering us from later. I really want to do these things in the right order. So I, I want to say that uh, there is something in politics uh, called the big lie. Um, and any politician that you have ever hated used it. Uh, probably the ones that you loved have used it too. But the point is, if you tell a lie that is so obvious, that is so just trivially disprovable or so outlandish, uh, then some people are going to say, there's no way he would be lying about something like that, because that's too easy to catch him at. So we end up with Ronald Reagan explaining how trees cause pollution. Um, and uh, who knows, maybe he believed what he was saying, but, but, uh, but I didn't. Um, and that's being used here. This is being called a way to keep dissidents safe. It is being advertised as a technology that uh, people in oppressive regimes can use. Um, and it isn't. It just can't be. Because if you make an encrypted DNS request uh, that I, as the oppressive regime, I'm an on-path attacker, I can see every package you're sending, I see, I see the answers, sure, you've encrypted it. And you know, unless I want to spend a great deal of uh, 
carbon footprint on the problem. I probably can't decrypt that soon enough to make it worth my while. Uh, so I won't see your question and I won't see what answer you got, but I will see the, the TCP SYN packet that immediately follows it, and that will go to an address that is not encrypted. Routers don't deal well with encrypted destination addresses. So you have to expose to me, the on-path attacker, where you go after you get the answer I couldn't see. And it's trivial data science to figure out that uh, if I know what address you went to, uh, I know what question you probably asked in order to get there. And there are a few exceptions. For example, if you go to Cloudflare, they've probably got two million different websites all answered by the same IP address. And so maybe the place you're going right now is hiding in a crowd, but the totality of places that you go across the course of an hour will be a unique fingerprint identifying a unique dissident whose door can be kicked in so that the handcuffs can go on. So I'm, I'm afraid that the DOH people are so overstating their case that they are going to get people killed. Most of us have explored the idea of local namespaces. There are certainly things like .local and .home and .corp that only work in one place, or they work everywhere, but they mean something local. They're not universal names like .com would be. Uh, all that goes out the window if you've got somebody using a DNS bypass so they're not talking to the only name server who knows what the right answer to those questions would be. And, you know, it's possible we should not be doing those things, but we are. And I don't know about you, but I'm not ready to have the web community tell me what the architecture of my digital business ought to be or what my security policy ought to be. And I'm being tarred, the, I'm painted with the same brush as the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party because I want to do parental controls. Now, I will tell you, I've got teenagers, and they will, they will gleefully admit that they are living in an oppressive regime. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, they can grow up and get a job, that's fine. Um, <laughs> While they're, while they're here, yes, that's true. I'm going to be in charge of whether some infection that they pick up somewhere is able to start up a crypto miner inside their browser. Um, that's my job, and I take it seriously. Um, and so I look exactly the same as any other oppressive regime from the point of view of DOH. Uh, I think that it is a design error. That is a technical mistake. We have to build protocols that work for the people who use them. And uh, this one, by having a political goal rather than a technical one, uh, has started us down a very difficult path. And, you know, I would put up with some of the costs I've mentioned if there were some benefit, but there isn't. Um, the benefit that they got was that a bunch of people got to be seen doing something. Um, and that's great, something's got to be done, so they did something. And if you think that Edward Snowden was a hero, then maybe you're looking at this and saying this was uh, you know, painful medicine for the world, but necessary given the abuses. I don't see things in that way, but uh, I understand that you know, politics is a very personal science. Um, but it isn't going to end well. Uh, this proceeds from the model that the CCP has an upper bound on the budget that they will spend on the Great Firewall. That if we just make it difficult enough, they will eventually reach a threshold where they cannot possibly spend more money, more power, hire more people, uh, to be, and that finally we'll have a, a web that uh, China can join without uh, the oppression of its government. I do not hold this view. Um, they are uh, they're pretty committed to their cause, and they have all the money. And they've currently hired more than a million of their citizens to uh, work in the Great Firewall Complex just to monitor the others. Um, and, uh, you know, as much as I would love to see sort of uh, real innovation, which would involve, you know, not having thought police coming from every country in the world, uh, I don't think this is the path that gets us there. I think this is the path that causes these countries to tighten things down even further. So, um, 
This is a form of internet governance which is insurgency. It's asymmetric guerrilla warfare. A small number of people create some new technologies, write some software, give it away, and then everybody lives differently. And frankly, that's what BSD did, that's what Linux did, and we are no longer under the crushing boot heel of telephone companies because of people like the ones in this room. So it's not a bad recipe, but it can be misapplied, and I think it is here. So I'd, I'd hate for you to think that that is all you have to worry about. So let me tell you what's coming next. Um, I mentioned time to next ad impression or time to next eyeball. So um, when somebody is visiting some web property somewhere, uh, social network or whatever it might be, and they click the mouse because they want to go somewhere and do something different, they want to make something happen, the time between that mouse click and the instant that their eyeball receives the first photon that has been shaped by the ad that is on the next page, that time interval is measurable. Because if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And they very much want to manage this because that time is one of the leading terms of the expression, how much money are we going to make this month? Um, so the idea that you're going to give a web browser some object, some HTML file, and it's going to parse that and find there are some anchors, and not everything is in line, uh, and that in order to fetch certain images or JavaScript blobs or CSS files, uh, it will then have to use the DNS resolver to go find the address that goes with the name by which that object is referred. Uh, that sounds like crazy talk to people who are in the web ad business. Uh, why don't we just give them all of the DNS information that they're going to need to fetch all of the subsidiary objects so that we can be sure that the time to the next eyeball is as short as the laws of physics will allow. Um, sadly, they're not DNS people, so they're not planning to include any of the DNSSEC signatures that it would take that browser to know whether they are uh, hearing lies. Right? Normal DNS has now got authenticity built into it. It's not deploying as quickly as we might wish, but it does work. This has none of those things. Um, and what this opens up for me is the scary prospect that a web defacement where, you know, some, maybe it's anonymous, whatever, somebody gets into some website and modifies it in some way, um, they can include a reference to the malicious JavaScript, maybe it's a crypto miner, um, and they can also include the DNS information necessary to fetch it so that that, uh, that attack, uh, the, the injection of malicious logic into a network that I am responsible for defending can now proceed without me ever seeing a DNS query. I don't even get to see an encrypted DNS query on 443 because there is no query because the answer is force-fed. Now, it's my view that if you're going to provide information, you have to provide something by which its authenticity can be tested. Um, and the web people know this. When you include a uh, style a CSS file or a uh, JavaScript file or a Java blob, it's possible for the, the object that references you to include your hash, the SHA-1 or SHA-512 of the object uh, is known to the person who's referencing it. And that gives your browser a chance to know whether it's being redirected and it's fetching the wrong JavaScript from the wrong place. So then it's clear the web community knows about authenticity. They just don't think it matters for DNS. Uh, I sort of do. So we're in a time of uh, great trouble. I'm not sure what history will name this period uh, with all the populists and the chaos and the, the breakdown of institutions and the, the hyper-polarity of politics in general. Um, but one thing is sure is that uh, the definition of politeness has changed. Um, this is a statement that uh, somebody, some C-level executive at Mozilla made because they had announced a plan by which they were not only going to turn on this DOH thing uh, as an option or make it available as an option, they were going to turn it on. They were going to make certain networks turn this on by default. Um, and so that sounded so big brotherish that so many people complained that they decided to clarify their intent. And they said, well, we are going to do this uh, and we're not going to ask. 
But we will tell you, there will be a pop-up indicating that this change has been made. Okay. I remember when politeness used to mean asking before you change somebody's config in a way that alters their, their topology. Um, and the, in the UK, they have other problems, not just Brexit. Um, and it is a matter of national law that ISPs there have to block uh, references to online child abuse material. Uh, they don't have to report, uh, so pedophiles don't necessarily get caught faster there, but pedophiles are less able to find what they're looking for because all of the well-known places where online child abuse material is stored cannot be reached through any ISP in the United Kingdom by law. And the C-level executives can go to jail if that is not the case. And there is no stay out of jail free card that comes along by saying, well, look, we, we would have blocked it, but they bypassed our, our DNS infrastructure, and so we couldn't block it. You need to go talk to Mozilla. That's not what happens. What happens is the CEO of British Telecom goes to jail. Um, that's, the, that's real politique, man. That's the way the world actually works, which is different from what the ivory tower often thinks. Um, so the way that this is supposed to work is that the internet is a cooperative environment. If you don't speak the protocol correctly, the other end probably won't be able to hear you or you won't be able to hear them. So we cooperate about following protocols, at least to the extent that we're forced to by bug reports. Um, if I've got a domain name that's universally assigned to me, you know, the FSI.io would be an example, no one else can use it. They could certainly try, they could make use of it, but it wouldn't work very well for them and it would injure me. So we have this cooperative model where everybody agrees that once an address or a name or something has been assigned somewhere, that's where it is, and the rest of us have to find a different one. It's another form of communication, or excuse me, cooperation. And everybody along the path uh, has the ability to withdraw their cooperation. Um, when I started the first anti-spam company, we just uh, would advertise the ability to, uh, you could find as a SMTP listener, you could uh, discover some reputation about the IP address that was tr trying to connect to you in order to send email. And you could, because it was your SMTP server, decide to move out of the way so that uh, your particular line on this uh, row of lines was no longer in order. And uh, you could just say, cooperation, that uh, co my cooperation is revocable. Uh, the privilege of using my equipment from, from a distance can be uh, denied. Uh, that's how it's always been. And this is the first time ever that the IETF has standardized a protocol purposely designed to make that not so. Now, I used to tell people who were letting too much spam come from their networks that they had to stop, and they used to say, oh, that's my, my customer's doing that, there's nothing I can do about it. Well, actually you can, you can disconnect them. Why should I do that? Why should I be responsible for what my customer did? Well, because I am holding you responsible for what's coming out of your network. And you can apply that pressure any way you like, including just not sending email to my subscribers. Um, but it was a distributed negative cooperation system in a way. Um, I don't know how we're gonna hold people responsible for the sewage coming out of their networks if they can point to DOH as an example of traffic that they are deliberately by deliberate internet standardization, not able to block. But it seems like a recipe for a lot more irresponsible action. All right, so this is, uh, I guess we're taping this, so I'll say it is a poop sandwich. Um, what happens when, you, when somebody wants to behave unilaterally is that they give uh, somebody else only bad choices. And then we, uh, having this imposed upon us, are expected to choose the least bad of those choices. Uh, and this works. This is the way most political and economic pressure is applied. Um, so we are now expected to just let all this intrusion and maliciousness and supply chain poisoning happen. That's one of our options. Uh, just say DNS bypass is the fact of life. Uh, we could stop thinking that any network can ever be secure and that you would have to go uh, down into every device and find a way to make that IoT light bulb secure before you let it on your network. Uh, good luck with that.
but uh, to move beyond perimeters. The Zero Corp initiative is an example of that. Um, we could be told to create smaller networks so that we have an explicit whitelist for the small number of things that the devices on that network are allowed to touch. And if you're not on the list, then it just won't work. That's a walled garden approach, very expensive in opportunity cost and implementation cost. Uh, I had a Chromecast stop working because uh, it no longer thought it was on net. And a few TCP dumps later, I found out that the reason is it was ignoring my DHCP assignment of what recursive name server it was supposed to use. I'll give you exactly one guess as to what name server it was using. Uh, hint, it wasn't Cloudflare's. Um, so I gave it an 8.8 .8 to talk to, and then it came back and everything was fine. But I have a question, which is, why does Google get to decide how much PII my network is going to expose? Uh, well, because they make the Chromecast, that's why. And might makes right until the regulators catch up, and usually that takes 50 years. So we are in the pre-regulatory period where anybody with enough power can get away with whatever they want. So we could just allow all of this, um, or we could proxy everything, right? TLS 1.3 with encrypted SNI now makes it that you can't stick a man-in-the-middle proxy at the edge of your enterprise network like you used to be able to do so that you could block certain traffic. You now have to block all of it. Uh, because the browser has to be, or the initiator has to be aware of that proxy. Uh, the protocol no longer permits the type of man-in-the-middle transparent proxy that we've been doing. Uh, going back to the UK for a moment, uh, if you are banking from your desk, you're on the co company's network, you're on your lunch hour, and you want to log into your bank, uh, and the company forces you to reveal that information to them, they have broken the law. Um, so I'm not sure that this is going to be practical, but I do know that if we do it, it, the world will be considerably less free than it was before DOH came to save it. And remember, it's not the crime, it's the cover-up that ultimately makes history. Or you could do something different. Uh, and that's why we're here. Um, Possession is nine-tenths of the law. It's my network, and uh, it will proceed by my rules. That is the tradition, and that is how I have always felt and how I still feel. Um, and this is not exactly what I wanted to work on next, but uh, I know how to avoid the poop sandwich that I'm being offered. Um, and I have an acceptable use policy, and it is enforced. If somebody complains to me about stuff coming from my network, I'm going to accept responsibility for that traffic, and I'm going to apologize for the harm that was done, and I'll get rid of the DDoS bot or the open relay or whatever it is they're complaining about because it's my network. I can't claim to own it if I simultaneously claim that I'm not responsible for what it does. And you can also get a little creative about that proxy thing. You can uh, try to come up with a way that the things that might have DOH on them go through a proxy, and the things that certainly don't, or at the moment are not suspected to support DOH, don't have to go through a proxy. Uh, and that way, we can apply minimum force to solve the problem, instead of uh, applying so much force that we create the next counter-revolution. So, um, when it, using time uh, too, too quickly here. So um, I have a demonstration of an idea that, uh, that occurred to me. And uh, it is one that might not occur to anybody, so I'm going to be talking about it. This will ultimately be open source software. Uh, if any part of it is patented, that patent will be made available for free, royalty free, et cetera, et cetera. It will be a defensive patent. Um, because I have been using FreeBSD on all of my own systems for the last couple of decades, I've closely watched uh, things like IP divert. Uh, I actually knew the CEO at Whistle Communications, and I was uh, very thankful to him for the, the things they gave away, rather than have all of their technology be locked in some lawyer's safe after they went bankrupt. Um, but IPFW and IP divert are 
part of a potential solution. Uh, passive DNS is another part of the solution, right? I'm gathering uh, DNS cache mistransactions at, in my day job from four or 500 servers around the world. I'm getting a quarter million cache mistransactions per second. And we have a database that has the unique patterns that have been witnessed in that since 2010. And we sell that into the security industry. Uh, we're not the only ones. There is a two dozen different ways that you can get to passive DNS. But you sort of need a passive DNS database that is fed by the world, or at least by a large part of it, rather than just one made from your own lookups. If all, you, if all you can see is the part of the DNS space that your users and applications have visited, this trick won't work. But um, encrypted SNI and TLS 1.3 are, again, you, you, you can't put a transparent proxy in the middle of it. Um, but that does not mean that it is immune to an enumeration attack. So let me walk you through what's going on here. On the upper left, I am telnetting to port 444. I didn't want to break 443 during my testing. Um, there's an IPFW table on the right. You can see I'm creating a couple of tables. And I have uh, the usual set of rules. We're going to pass the TCP setup, that means a SYN packet, that are outbound to a distant port 444 if the destination is in the go table. Then we're going to reject and send a reset or an ICMP on reach uh, if that destination address is in the no table. And otherwise, uh, we divert to port 444. And diversion just means that. Uh, you get to take the packet out of the kernel, put it in user mode, make a decision about it. Um, and then for all other traffic, just let it go. That last part is tricky. If you, uh, if you don't have that there, then you will lose your SSH session and you have to go to the console. So uh, I like to say that all power tools can kill. So what's happening when I do that telnet is that my TCP SYN packet is going to the divert and uh, just below that telnet command, uh, so just below the upper left, you can see the output of a program running on that divert socket. And so you see it noticing that my network 10 address on some port is trying to reach port 444 on some distant server. Now, telnet knew the name, www.fsi.io, and did a DNS lookup and got that address, 104.244, whatever. But the SYN packet doesn't have the name. So it's very difficult to do an enumeration attack if all you have is an IP address, because you will connect to the, the listener to find out if it supports DOH so that you can block it, but you don't know what SNI to give, right? Encrypted SNI means that you don't know what your internal clients are trying to do once they get a TCP connection established to that service. So I'm using passive DNS to enumerate all of the address records which have referred to that address in the last day. Um, so you can see this is now a complete catalog of everything that server is able to answer for. And it's possibly an information leak, but frankly, if you want to keep something secret, I recommend not putting it in the DNS. Now you'll see that there are two invocations of this. That's because it's a cheesy little C program doing it, and it doesn't have any deduplication. And what's happening up at that telnet is because I'm diverting the SYN packet, it's getting no answer. And so TCP, on its behalf, inside the connect system call, is repeating the TCP SYN. It will do that up to five times on our systems and up to 50 times on Linux systems. So it's an interesting amplification vector. Um, so I stopped it after two. Uh, but trust me, there would have been five, and then it would have timed out. Uh, so if you look at the pseudocode on the bottom, you can see the absolutely trivial uh, method I intend to pursue here, and that's what that IPFW table also tells you. Uh, you know, we're going to use passive DNS to get the domain names that have been seen pointing at an IP, and then for each such domain name, we're gonna see if DOH works there. And if it does, this IP address goes into the no bucket. And if it doesn't, it goes into the okay bucket. Uh, by which I mean that I only have to test this periodically. 
right? The way people normally fill their IPFW tables is to put a value next to each, uh, each key, and that value tends to be the Unix time when it was created so that you can sweep through later and say, let's just delete everything older than two hours and force a reprobe on those. Um, so that part obviously is not, uh, not done. Um, so you can see on the right, under the IPFW table, you can see that there is a, uh, the usual read-write, uh, read-eval print loop. Um, and this loop always appears in, in network programs. Uh, sometimes it's unrolled, sometimes it's event-based, but ultimately you're taking input and doing something with it. And there's that, uh, the actual access to the passive DNS uh, system is through a library. So uh, all we're doing right now is uh, printing the names that it's finding. Uh, what I want you to have some confidence in is that the systems which collectively do this type of answer, uh, not just from my company, but from everyone in the business, are able to handle this problem at scale. Uh, the, these are already handling many billions of transactions per day. Uh, for other reasons that look a lot like this one. But this is the specific way that that knowledge can be used to make an enumeration attack against somebody who doesn't want you to know what names they're using. Um, I don't love having to attack the internet to keep myself safe, but we're doing it. And we're gonna find a way that uh, the people who run uh, this type of method we'll be able to share data with each other. So if I've already tested an address, then you might be able to find out from some uh, uh, crowdsourcing method that it's already been tested recently enough by someone you trust that you don't need to test it yourself. And I'll give you all a way that you can share your test results as well, because we are gonna need some scale here. Now, before I move off of this, uh, I wanna say that we need more red teaming at the design level. You need to be looking at this, as I do, and say, if I was a bad guy, how would I get around this? Um, and there are two classes of bad guy. There's uh, somebody who has the best of intentions and thinks that I might have political dissidents in my, in my company, and then we have people who mean me harm. Uh, in either case, our interests are unaligned, and in either case, they might have a reason to work around this somehow. Now, one way to work around it would be to run a non-IETF protocol and have all of, your, all of these transactions occur using some very private method. But frankly, if you do that, then other defenses I have, like uh, flow spec monitoring, are gonna catch you. Um, so if you have to do something anomalous in order to, do, to get your job done, I've probably already got something in place. The beauty, from their point of view of DOH is that it's not anomalous. It looks like normal web traffic. So I'm not so much worried about stopping people that I'm already stopping by other methods. And if they change the RFC so that testing requires more logic, I will, of course, implement that RFC. So I'm not really interested in uh, workarounds for this. Uh, I'm trying to make it fail by default so that I can create an early opposing market force uh, so that the people who think that uh, putting a DOH server on every IP address that they have is the right way to help dissidents in Turkey will understand that they will be unreachable from the part of the network who implements this. In other words, I want them to think twice before joining, just like they want me to think twice before blocking. Because in 2019, that's what passes for uh, cooperation. So I go around the world telling people things that they didn't care about, and uh, fairly often I don't have a solution to propose. In this case, I do. Um, but the reason I have to do this is that most people only want to solve the problems they have. Very few of us are able to consider the butterfly effect of uh, you know, drinking a cup of coffee. Uh, that's just too much detail. On the other hand, most of us would like to live a life where we do no harm. And so somewhere in the middle, depending on your level of passion, your level of aggression, uh, perhaps your level of insanity, you'll find a comfortable resting place. Um, I want to prevent other people from having problems due to my success, unless those people are criminals. 
right? If you're out there to steal or cause any kind of injury using the internet, uh, then I'm going to be doing what I can to stop you and make you less successful. If, on the other hand, you're a live and not live type and you just want to live cooperatively with everybody, then I want to do everything I can to support you. And I can't dedicate my life to this. I tried, but it, after 18 years at uh, ISC, I found that I really needed to, uh, to, to be doing something bigger than uh, boiling the ocean every day. Um, but the, the specific way that most of us and most of most technologists in the world uh, gradually work against our own interests is that every day we solve the problems we have by creating something, some new complexity, uh, which looks like a feature, uh, a new, new capability for somebody who's running our software. Um, and that complexity adds up. Um, uh, the total cost of the creating one if statement in code that is widely deployed will turn out to be about $10,000. Um, and I realize that's a really long time scale. On the other hand, as you see from global warming, uh, the sea eventually does rise. And if we had maybe thought more about this in the 1990s, we might be in a better position than we are now with regard to that tipping point. So DNS, uh, was the first system ever to scale by a factor of 10 to the ninth. And it is still the, same, the fundamentally same protocol and same architecture that it had in the mid 80s. It's the only distributed, coherent, reliable, autonomous, hierarchical database ever. And now that I see how the world uses it and how people leverage it in order to make money for themselves so that they can sell and get out, uh, I think DNS may be the last system of this kind. Um, I like the puzzle of trying to keep it running. Um, that's just my affliction. Um, on the other hand, I want to remind everyone, including any shareholder who may be watching the video, uh, this is not what I get paid for. Um, I am the CEO of a security company, and I have other responsibilities, but I can't stop. There's something bad going on, and I cannot stop myself from caring about it and doing something about it. And I don't want you to stop either. Uh, BSD was the first internet-capable operating system. When we had 16 bits, and we're lucky to have every one of them, and uh, a version of C that would only let you use a certain structure member once, and it could not be duplicated inside of other structures, unless it had the same type and the same offset. Uh, a bunch of people put together a working set of internet tools, uh, which then allowed the internet to flourish, which, you know, obviously uh, has made room for Microsoft and um, Linux and so forth. But it all started with the community that you're part of, who did not like the world as it was and were willing to bite off something way bigger than they could chew. Please don't stop. Thank you.